Hello and welcome. This is Will Rems for Create the Learning Site, the place to go deeper in your understanding of the Bible. Does God know the future in detail, the way he knows the present and the past? After last month's look at God and time, it is now time, pun intended, to ask this follow-up question. And because it's a long answer, I'm going to split it up into two uh, videos again. One book arguing against God's exhaustive foreknowledge has the curious title, God of the Possible. Why would we want to serve and worship the God of the Possible? Would we not rather serve the God of the Impossible? Isn't that how the Bible characterizes God? Nothing will be impossible with God, and with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And shouldn't all things include God for knowing the future? In all fairness, though, we should not expect God to be able to do what is logically and otherwise impossible because it leads to absurdities. Creating a square circle would be in this category. And, according to the author of the book, Greg Boyd, so is knowing what people will freely choose to do in the future. Strictly speaking, then, the book is about the God of the non-absurd, but no one would buy a book with that title, so I, I understand the author went with God of the Possible. I should add, this is probably more important for the author, and he especially also seems to have openness theology in view with his title. God is not the God of certainty, through foreknowledge of the future, but the God who knows and works with the possibilities of an undetermined future. The implied contrast is not so much possible and impossible, but rather possible and certain. But is it absurd and therefore impossible for God to know the future? This is a far more interesting question than the pros and cons of a book title. I will first state in brief summary the argument in favor of foreknowledge, and then I will take a more extensive and critical look at the case against it. What is at stake, by the way, is whether God foreknows the decisions and choices of humans. Everyone agrees that God foresees things like solar eclipses, earthquakes, and the movement of objects in space. In such cases, we are dealing with strict cause and effect relationships. But what about the supposedly free decisions of intelligent and morally responsive agents? It is here that opinions diverge. The case for foreknowledge. First, foreknowledge and several related terms such as to foreknow and to foresee are words that appear in the Bible. The concept was well established in the ancient world. Scripture appears to affirm it. Two, there are more than a few examples in scripture where God foreknows and foretells what will happen and what people will do. Three, church history shows that belief in God's foreknowledge was virtually unanimous among Christians until quite recently. This is different from views of time and God's eternity, on which the historical record shows a measure of diversity. The church father Augustine could categorically claim for a being who does not know all the future is certainly not God. And much later, C.S. Lewis wrote, everyone who believes in God at all believes that he knows what you and I are going to do tomorrow. As recent as the 1940s, Lewis simply assumed that being a Christian implied faith in God's foreknowledge. It doesn't prove God's foreknowledge, but it does count for something. Although Christians used to agree on foreknowledge, they differed, and still differ today, in their understanding of it. It may be useful to briefly list four common explanations. In the static view of time, that is, when all of time exists now, if God is outside of time, for knowledge becomes somewhat easier to imagine. In that case, God is, in a sense, located before or in front of time, and overlooks all of it from his timeless position. Past and future events are all eternally present to him. 
I don't consider this view of time likely, but it would provide us with a relatively simple explanation of foreknowledge. In the Augustinian and Calvinist view, God foreknows because he foreordains or predestines. He logically knows what he has decided that will happen. In this view, there is nothing mystical or surprising about God's foreknowledge. It does lead to vexing questions about human freedom and responsibility. Some Calvinists deny human freedom or redefine free will in such a way that it is arguably not free anymore. Other Calvinists affirm both predestination and freedom. How both can be true is, of course, a perennial theological discussion. Then there is simple foreknowledge, which is precisely that, the belief that God simply knows what the future will be because he is God, without offering an explanation. It comes with being God. Middle knowledge is the view advocated by William Lane Craig. It's not an easy concept. Middle knowledge is hypothetical knowledge about what people would do if. In other words, God knows what person X would freely choose to do if situation Y were true or real, and what X would freely choose if, instead of Y, Z were the case. Based on this middle knowledge, God decides which world he wants to make real, Y or Z. This gives him control over what will happen without having to intervene in the free will decisions of his creatures. This is therefore more an explanation of how God's sovereignty and human freedom can both be true than an explanation of foreknowledge, but it does add depth to the concept. God knows not only what will be, but also what could have been. Okay, we're now ready to turn to a fifth view, that of open theism, and the argument against God's exhaustive foreknowledge. The first argument claims that there is nothing to see or to know. Because the future does not exist, it cannot be known. We should recognize that this implies a radical redefinition of omniscience. The term has always been understood as God knowing everything about the past, the present, and the future. In open theism, God's knowledge of the future is limited. It excludes all the free decisions of creatures with free will. Opponents of open theism complain that the redefined concept does not qualify as omniscience. It would be fairer to say that, on the openness view, God is not omniscient. They also argue that it is not obvious that knowledge of the future is impossible. The openness argument fails, so they say, because it assumes and assert, asserts its claim, but does not prove it. After all, even humans have beliefs about the future. Often enough, these turn out to be wrong, but God does not hold a false belief. He must therefore have beliefs about the future, and these beliefs cannot be wrong. In other words, it would seem that, in order to be God, God must know the future. He has to be truly omniscient. So the counter-argument. The burning question, of course, is how can the future be known? Or more precisely, how can God know the future? Clearly, God does not see the future in any literal sense, not only because there is nothing to see, but also because God does not have eyes or ears. Human knowledge comes through our senses, or perhaps we know things because others have told us. But God does not have sense organs, and he does not know because he was told. This is not just a problem for God's future knowledge. It is also an open question how God knows anything else. How does God have exhaustive knowledge of the present and the past? He knows my heart and my thoughts better than I know myself. He knows everything about me. He knows the number of hairs on my head. How does he acquire all this knowledge? Let's be honest, we have no idea. In the words of Psalm 139, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Therefore, the fact that we don't know how the future could be foreknown is not an argument against foreknowledge. 
Okay, now to a second argument. It claims that foreknowledge implies determinism. If God foreknows what someone will do, that person is no longer free to do otherwise because God cannot be wrong. Here's what it looks like in formal logic. God foreknows that I will drink tea instead of coffee tomorrow. God cannot be wrong. Therefore, I have no choice. I must drink tea instead of coffee tomorrow. However, this argument is based on logical error. The statements made reside in the realm of logic, not causation or chro chronology. It is logical that if A and B are true, I will drink tea tomorrow. But it only establishes that something is a logical necessity. Logically, if God foreknows something, then it will happen. There is no causal or other necessity involved that limits my options. Nothing is determined or even influenced by God for knowing something. Must is totally the wrong word here. In fact, it is superfluous to have God and foreknowledge included in the equation at all. All we need is a statement about the future that is true. I can simplify the reasoning as follows. I will drink tea instead of coffee tomorrow. This statement is true. Therefore, I have no choice. I must drink tea tomorrow. Here's yet another way to bring out the logical error. That I will drink tea instead of coffee chronologically follows God's foreknowledge, but logically it is prior to God's foreknowing what I will do. God foreknows it because I will do it, not the other way around. This means if I were to do something different, that is, I would not drink tea instead of coffee tomorrow, then God would foreknow something different as well. Conclusion C, therefore, is false. I do have a choice, regardless of whether God foreknows it. C should read, therefore, I will, not I must, drink tea instead of coffee tomorrow. Open theists may retort that it is impossible for God to know this. If it is my free choice what I will drink tomorrow, God cannot know ahead of time what I will choose. But why would this be true? How do we know God's knowledge is limited in this way? It is merely asserted, not proven. What is true is that I don't know how God knows it, but we already discussed this. That I don't know or understand something hardly counts as an argument against it. I don't know how God knows everything about the present and the past either. It needs to be admitted that all of this does not prove for knowledge, but it does answer this philosophical argument against it. The third and most important argument, there are numerous passages in the Bible that, if taken at face value, imply that God does not know the future. Advocates of God's foreknowledge typically explain these passages as anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism is a description or representation of God in human terms and analogies. If God shows himself surprised, for instance, this should be taken as a merely human way of speaking about God. He was not truly taken by surprise. The statement brings out how surprising something is from a human point of view. There is anthropomorphism in the Bible, and open theism acknowledges this. In fact, there is a lot of anthropomorphism in the Bible. We often read that God sees or hears or speaks, we read of his hands and face, etc. None of this is literally true, even though it communicates things about God that are true indeed. So anthropomorphism is plentiful in the Bible, but it is valid to ask how literal each statement should be taken. In what follows, I will discuss some of the most important examples brought forward by open theism, in which it denies anthropomorphism and argues for a more literal reading. God is frustrated. Especially in the prophets, God at times expresses his frustration over Israel's behavior. I don't find this argument persuasive. One may well feel frustration, even if the cause of it is something one anticipated. God repents. Well, this proves too much at least if one insists on the King James translation of repent, 
for the Hebrew word that is used here, Nicham. After all, in modern English, repentance implies more than an error or mistake. Moral wrongdoing has taken place. But surely no one wants to argue that God was morally in the wrong, for instance, when he appointed Saul king over Israel and later repented of this. Interestingly, uh, in this chapter in 1 Samuel, the verb nicham is used four times, twice to state that God did repent and twice to state that he does not repent. Modern translations use words like regret, grieve, relent and be sorry. Open theists do think that God can make mistakes and regret them, not repent of them. Since he does not fully know the future, he may engage in a course of action that turns out to be wrong-headed, and then God regrets and changes his mind, so open theism. However, we should notice that to regret something may also carry the sense of to grieve. It does not necessarily imply mistake or error in the sense of I should have done something different. But in that case, this is similar to the previous point. It does not prove the absence of foreknowledge. One may feel deep regret and pain over something, even if one knew that it was going to happen. Case in point, the death of people you love, especially if they are significantly older than you. We all know that our grandparents and our parents are going to die. Knowing this does not prevent grief and regret when they do die. So let's update the language to God changes his mind. Is this anthropomorphism? Open theists think not. They want to take the language seriously and not explain it away. According to them, God indeed changes his mind. For instance, when people repent. I already discussed the case of Nineveh's repentance in the previous issue. Examples like these, where people change, hardly qualified as a true change in God. Naturally, he responds differently to the repentant. And wasn't this the whole point in sending Jonah to Nineveh, something the prophet understood all too well? God intended to spare the city from the start. This example has nothing to prove God did not know what would happen. Jeremiah 18 sums up the general principle. If God threatens a nation with destruction and it repents, God relents, the Hebrew word nicham. And if he promises to build a nation and it turns to evil ways, he will also relent of the good he intended to do. Is that change or is it consistency? Here is a different kind of example. What about Isaiah 38 and Hezekiah's illness? God sends the prophet Isaiah to announce that Hezekiah will die. The king prays. Isaiah has not yet left the palace and he is sent back to announce that God is adding 15 years to his life. Does God change his mind this easily, almost capriciously? Did God not anticipate that Hezekiah would pray when faced with such tidings? Or is this response precisely what he was aiming for? It seems likely to me that God here shares his middle knowledge. If nothing out of the ordinary happens, Hezekiah would die of this disease. Sharing this information is almost an invitation to pray. God is certainly not taken by surprise. His answer to Hezekiah's prayer, therefore, is instantaneous. By the way, if God does not fully know the future, he's taking a significant risk with his promise to add 15 years to Hezekiah's life. All sorts of free decisions made both by Hezekiah and by others could have interfered with his lifespan. How about that great example of intercession in the Old Testament? Moses stepping into the gap when the people of Israel make the golden calf. Did Moses manage to change God's mind? At first sight he did. God tells Moses he wants to burn the people to ashes. Taken at face value, it might suggest that God rather easily loses control in an outburst of violent emotion and lets his anger burn ready to strike. But perhaps we should not take this element 
too literally. Fortunately, Moses is there to remind God of his promise to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and to point out the consequences for God's reputation among the Egyptians. One could get away from this passage thinking that Moses is more loving and caring than God. Better to fall into the hands of Moses than into the hands of God. Or does the passage teach us how easily God is turned around through intercession and repentance, because he strongly prefers to act mercifully, but needs a reason to do so, perhaps in order to avoid the impression that it doesn't matter what we do. Seeing he sets Moses and Nineveh and us up to turn him around through intercession and repentance, what else did he expect that they and we would do? Is he really turned around or was he facing that way, the way of grace and forgiveness all along? The quickness of God's response to Moses suggests the latter. One last example under this heading. What about Genesis 6? The Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. And he said, I am sorry that I've made them. I'm a bit surprised by the open theist insistence that this is to be taken literally. The book of Genesis is written in a deliberately simple style full of anthropomorphism. God walks through the garden. He asks Adam and Eve what they have done. Does this imply his ignorance? When humans build a tower, God comes down to see what they are doing. God visits Abraham on his way to Sodom because he has heard the outcry against it and wants to see for himself whether things really are that bad. Notice that this appears to put a limit not on God's knowledge of the future, but of the present. Taken literally, it would imply God is far from omniscient and that he is not omnipresent either. He has to go there to see. After deliberating with himself, God decides to share his intention for Sodom and Gomorrah with Abraham. At other times, God remembers things. I realize it is a real question in interpretation where the line between anthropomorphism and more direct or more literal descriptions of God needs to fall. But I'm not convinced by the line drawn in open theism. If we are to take the language in Genesis 6 literally, why not in these other passages? Or vice versa, if the other examples are not to be taken literally, why this one? It is obviously possible to read examples like these in different ways. And therefore, they do not disprove for knowledge. This is the end of this first part. I will continue my investigation of the argument, the open theist argument against foreknowledge in the second part.